Uh, Mr. Gray? Yep. Uh, just a reminder before we begin, well, Mills is going to do a, a quick speech. Uh, after that, if you could go over the, you know, the setup of the debate, two minutes per per answer and all of that, so the audience can understand too. Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Make sure you're projecting your voices. Oh, come on. <clears throat> hmm. Can you all hear me? Great. Welcome to the, um, well, what should have been the second debate, but it's the first. Uh, we've got four candidates here, and there's going to be typical debate rules, just so everybody knows, two minutes per candidate, with rebuttals of two minutes. The candidates are, if you could just introduce yourselves, starting with this one. Howdy, Ashlyn Gray. Hello, how are you all doing? My name is Timothy Metro. I am a defense attorney running for governor. Good afternoon, Tommy Morello. Good evening, Dr. Trip Taylor. And those are the four candidates that you'll be hearing today. Your moderator. Introduce yourself. Uh, Mr. Chris Gray here. From Weasel News. And we'll be keeping an eye over it to make sure debate rules are followed as well, federal judges, but I don't see anything issue that will come up, I'm sure. Um, Mr. Gray will be able to handle that. I'd like to put one thanks out to federal judge Albert Pierce for setting everything up. He's put a lot of work into this. And if everybody could give him a round of applause, he'll be retiring this week for the Department of Justice. He has um, put a long time and a lot of effort into the Department of Justice as a very valued member. Um, I know a lot of you have been on the other side of his um, stances, but he's been a very fair judge. He's put a lot of time and effort, and I think he, he deserves a long round of applause. So, so thank you, Federal Judge Pierce, for your service to the city and state. Hope you get some rest, motherfucker. Yes, get some rest with your children in Guadalajara. <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, everybody in the audience, if you could do your best to keep things under control, um, you know, stay in your seats, don't yell, keep yourselves in order so that the police don't have to get involved, and enjoy yourselves. All right, welcome everybody to the debate. As he says, I'm going to ask the questions of the candidates. We are going to start with Miss Gray, and we're going to work the other way. And as we go through them, they'll each have two minutes to answer their questions. And after the questions have all been answered, they'll get two minutes to do the rebuttal to the questions. Uh, we got a few questions picked out, so we'll be going through the questions and everything. This is your only time right now to do your cheering. So if you guys want to cheer, get it out of the way before we start the debate. Yeah. I'm not a cheerleader, bro. Come on. I love debates. I'm unbiased and not go able to cheer me. for specific candidates. So go candidates. Yay. All go right. Candidates. All right. We're going to be starting here with a Miss Gray. Miss Gray, the first question is, the Blaine County right now is stagnated in terms of economic development. How do you plan us to establish and maintain a vibrant economy in this area of our state? And the timer starts now. Very interesting question. Um, I'm actually from Sandy, so I've known that it's been kind of in its rut for a while now. And uh, with the dispersion of the sheriff's office up there, at least, you know, BCSO not being much of a thing anymore, I feel like it's become even worse. A good idea for it would just to be opening more businesses. And that's one of my main plans is uh, basically just supporting businesses, having them spread their wings and going farther. Uh, hopefully planning some more events up that way as well, because there's a nice huge lake that seems to be pretty unused. That's all for my answer. All right.
All right, now we're going to go to Mr. Metro. Your timer starts now. So one of the main things, uh, one of the main problems that we have in this city is uh, homelessness. So one thing that I would like to do with Sandy is that's where I would like to put my temporary low income housing. So people who meet a, a certain a certain threshold, you've been in the city a certain amount of time. We, uh, the government, would give you a home for a certain amount of time and there you would stay and it would be a uh, very low cost. And um, I believe that would bring a big boom to not only the existing businesses in Sandy, but it would bring a boom in general by adding more people into the homes that exist there already. So that would be probably one of the main things that I do. Number two is uh, running lots of different and separate events up there um, all over Sandy. And these two main things are, is, is really how I would get that done. End of, end of my uh, answer. All right. Uh, Mr. Monroe? Uh, so I would like to, to pay some attention to the two businesses that are already up there. You know, we have several temporary businesses up in county right now. And while they're doing good, I feel like uh, overall the community needs to pay them some more mind. If we can, uh, you know, get one of these businesses to a, a more official status, I feel like it would encourage more, you know, more opportunists to set, you know, uh, more temporary businesses up there. Because... That's uh, after all, that's how you get foot traffic, right? You need more reasons for people to travel up north. Uh, I really like the idea about the, the lake sports. You know, me personally, I love spending the day up there. Uh, you know, I don't have time to do so anymore, but it's a very beautiful location, uh, especially Polito, you know, but specifically Sandy. I think we focus on those, uh, those temporary businesses which are already there. End of answer. All right, Miss Tally. So, being that there is some current temporary businesses up there, I think that it's important to fund them and help them get their permanent business status, which would I think incentivize more people to go up to Sandy. I think also starting more temporary businesses and encouraging them, whether it be with funding or giving them the support and supplies that they need to start another business up there, like the bait and tackle shop that was already open up there, would love to see that open again. I think that was a great reason for people to go up to Sandy, spend some time up there. It gave people things to do with not only their friends and their families. It also gave them a little bit of extra income on top and getting more people involved with that. I know they did close down. I'm not sure as to exactly why, but I'm sure that if they had some more support from an entity like the governor or just the state in general, they would have been able to prosper and thrive and that would have incentivized more people to go up there and support the businesses which are already open up there as well and create its own economy outside of the borders of Los Santos. That's all. All right, now we're going to take a chance to go back to you, Gray, and we have two minutes to do any rebuttal that you might have of anything that the candidates say. Uh, no, I don't have any rebuttal at this time for any of the other candidates for this round. Uh, Mr. Metro? Yes, uh, my uh, my rebuttal is for uh, Mr. Morello. You know, him being a, a business owner already, uh, have you ever uh, attempted to mentor or lend a hand to the existing businesses that are up there at the moment or in the past? Is this something that I can answer now or do you need to wait for my rebuttal? Wait, wait for yes, no, rebuttal. that's the end of the question. Uh, Mr. Merrill? So I would answer yes. Yes, this is something that I have tried to do, uh, specifically with Mr. Johnson. I don't know if he's in the audience today. Um, you know, I've spoken to the new owners of Auto Exotics. Uh, one of them even approached me and asked me for advice on some things. And just like I said at my um, my permanent business panel for, uh, for Edible Encounters, you know, I encourage any temporary business to come to me and ask me for questions. As you know, at this point, I've gotten two of them to permanent. Uh, I really want to help. You know, I'm all about helping people really establish their dreams and seize every opportunity possible. Uh, I would offer a rebuke to the uh, the low income housing project. While I agree that that is a great idea, I would uh, I would simply prompt the question about where he plans to get the money from. That's the end of my rebuke. Uh, Miss Tally, no rebuttal.
All right, we're going to go on to question number two. All four candidates have proposed at least one ideal that would involve public spending, such as grants for businesses, health cares, and higher salary for the law enforcement, justice system reform, etc. How do you plan on either increasing or reallocating the budget in order to cover these new expenses? We're going to start with you, Mr. Metro. Uh, the first thing I'm doing is I'm completely forgoing my salary. I will not be taking a dime while I am the governor. And that will be one of the main contributing things to the city. Um, other than that, getting most of these temporary businesses up, helping them thrive the area. But basically, the main thing that, I, that I'm going to do is I'm not taking a salary whatsoever. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mora? So I've had a, a, a wonderful conversation with Captain Ranger at the DLC, and while he is not the warden, I still feel like his response to me holds a lot of weight. Uh, my reform, where I felt like we needed some more allocation, was within the DLC, both to generate interest and, you know, help people reduce some prison times, right? All while uh, operating in a profit out of that industry. Um, I proposed to him you know, a deal with the quarry nearby, you know, maybe form a chain gang, uh, some kind of labor program for inmates to both earn income so that way they can uh, have a more sustainable lifestyle when they get out of prison and also reduce their prison stints. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of programs like these that help felons get off, you know, get off of the wrong track and get back on their feet. And I feel like that's where uh, my funding for that idea would come from. That's the end of my answer. Let's tell it. I think that a good portion of the funding would most likely come from fines, from sending people off to the lovely Bowling Brook Penitentiary. Not that lovely. Um, of course, I don't plan on going on a spending spree giving businesses hundreds of thousands of dollars to get them off their feet, but you know, a couple tens of thousands of dollars just as a here you go here's something you can put back into your business you can invest this money you can take this money run with it get right get the right people in the right places to do with that money the best thing for the business and that's putting the money back into the pockets of the people who are not running around and putting a strain on SASP DOC SAFR and it's focusing on the people who want to live a lifestyle where they don't have to run around and commit a life of crime to contribute to society. Nothing further. And Ms. Gray. Yes, thank you. So, honestly, I believe that a good portion of this would have to come from any profits that I make personally, as well as within the sense of the community. I want to make sure that this would be something that could be sustained long after any candidacy that I would either be elected in or anyone else. I want it to be something that could be self-sustained eventually. Um, in this regard, it would come from a lot of the funds from community, from government, and uh, like Ms. Tally said, fines and otherwise. Um, I really want to put a focus on community within the city so we can all give each other a helping hand. That is all. Very good. Now we're going to have two minutes to be able to tell your thoughts of what the other candidates say, starting with you, Mr. Metro. Um, I would just, um, I would actually like a little more clarification on what Marilla was saying. If he could, if he could repeat that to me, I was slightly confused. Anything else? Was he saying that he was going to use the prison system in some sort of way? Um, for taxes? Is that what he was saying? I'm, I'm, I'm slightly lost. I don't really have a rebuttal. It's more of a clarification. Is he saying he's going to tax the prisoners or make them do hard labor? Is that what he's saying? That's a slightly cruel. All end, right. of the, uh, end of my question. Mr. Monroe? No, it would not be a tax program. And no, it would not be forced labor. The, uh, the program would definitely be voluntary. 
you know, obviously I'm not going to make you go out there and break rocks, but by all means, if you want to go out there and break some rocks to get some time off of your prison stint and, uh, you know, put a couple dollars in your pocket as well as contribute to the betterment of BOC, I don't think anybody here would have a problem with that. I would like to pay attention to Mr. Metro's plan of foregoing his salary to pay for low income housing and pay raises to the, uh, the SASP. Uh, you know, unless uh, this position is a multi-million dollar deal, I would argue that uh, the salary of one man is most definitely not enough for those programs. Well, the salary is just a small portion. Sorry, is it your turn? Uh, 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 come on. Still Mr. Morell's turn. End turn. Uh, tally? No rebuttal. All right, so we get to hear Miss Gray. Mm. Not at this time. All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to the next question. Roughly a year ago, the stock market crashed, leading to a huge depression after a period of overproduction and hyperinflation. What measures would you imply that could prevent such of this from happening again? Mr. Moreau. So I actually uh, graduated with an economics minor. I feel like it's very important to ensure that the economy does not inflate itself like last time. Uh, it was uh, it was a little bit ridiculous. I feel like the ways that we can do this is we can pay more attention to businesses like, um, like you know, the grocery stores, luxury autos, PDM. You know, as it stands right now, uh, Dynasty Eight. That is the really the only way for us to remove money from the economy. And while removing money from the economy sounds like a bad thing. Ultimately, that is uh, it's a necessary evil, right? It's something we have to provide more outlets for for people to spend their money and make sure that our economy is not only circulating uh, within our state, but also within our nation, right? We have to start pouring some of these dollars out of the country or not out of the country, sorry, out of the state. Uh, that is the end of my answer. Uh, Miss Tally? As someone who's been around the block and has lived through the economy crash that happened almost a year ago, I, uh, I have to agree with what Tommy is saying. There was plenty of money that was just floating around. People weren't spending it. There was not really any place where you could go spend your money where it wouldn't recirculate. And I think that's what the biggest problem was, is that money was just being passed around from one person to another person to another person, whether it was a business who was taking that money, spending it on something, going to another person, going to another person. So the biggest thing would be finding a way to remove that money and most likely use it towards something that would benefit the state as a whole, rather than having it circulate back into the pockets of people, such as state-run programs, um, and then that could also be used to fund some of the other programs that uh, all of us had actually planned for with our campaign videos. Nothing else to add. And you, Miss Gray? I, as well, had to go through this. Honestly, when it happened, I lost pretty much everything I had to my name. Um, but honestly, I think encouraging people to spend more and work more would be the best way to try to stabilize everything. It was a very hard time to go through, and I don't want to have us see it again. And honestly, um, it, t it takes a community to work towards that. Uh, just pushing for more communion, more uh, businesses, more just instead of from pocket to pocket, as as Trip said, uh, just focusing on putting it through and getting it out. That's all. Mr. Metro. Yes. Yeah, so my my proposal for uh, city sponsored events uh, every other weekend, I think that would take care of the inflation by uh, basically having people come out. Uh, taking money of the, out of their accounts and putting them into the businesses, and basically having a good circulation from person, from individual to establishment, and then so on and so forth and back and forth. But um, 
Yes, the city sponsored events every other week, and I think would solve that um, completely and keep it under check. Um, end of my um, statement. All right, we're going to go to the question phase. Uh, if you guys had any questions of what you've heard from the other candidates, we're going to start with you, Mr. Merrill. So I would like to uh, prompt a question to Mr. Metro, as well as uh, it's pretty much a rebuttal. Uh, I would uh, I would disagree with the statement of passing it from, you know, a citizen to a business. Uh, while the trickle-down effect is great, right? Ultimately, that does not stop the problem of money just passing hands from another person to another person. That's just a money passing hands from a citizen to a citizen with an extra step in between. Because, you know, ultimately, if you are a business owner and you're just hoarding money, you're doing a disservice to the economy. And that is the only way for really that solution to work is if business owners just hoarded money. That's the end of my rebuttal. Ms. Tally? I would agree with uh, Morello. I think that having people hoard their money if it's going right back into businesses is really the only way to remove that money from the economy. And like I said, that was part of the reason I believe that the economy crashed is because there was so much money floating around there. Um, I mean, people in the last days had so much money, they didn't know what to do with it. They were just frivolous, frivolously spending on whatever they wanted instead of whatever they needed. So I think that putting together programs to completely remove that money from the economy would be a surefire way to prevent that from happening again. Nothing else. Ms. Gray? No, not at this time. Uh, Mr. Metro? Well, the thing is, is um, I, I, don't under, I don't think he understands what the trickle-down effect is. Trickle-down effect is when the government gives businesses tax breaks in hopes that uh, the money that they receive from the tax breaks will trickle down to the employee. This has nothing to do with that. This has to do with commerce, individual to the business giving money. Then that business hires more employees due to the uh, due to these constant events that are happening, and that money goes to the individuals. So that has nothing to do with the trickle down effect whatsoever. It's a completely that doesn't even make any sense what he said, but. It'll go from individual to the business. Business is getting more business, so they hire more people. They pay the people. It goes back to the individual. It's simple economics, really, it is. And that is it. Thank you. All righty. We're going to go ahead and move to the next question. It's going to be dealing with neighborhoods. Neighborhoods like Davis, Ranchero, Strawberry, and Chamberlain Hills have suffered a drastic increase in crimes and violence within the last few months. Furthermore, first responders who enter the said neighborhoods in order to assist with these issues seem to be at constant risk. How do you plan on reducing these increased levels of crime while keeping safe both our first responders and the citizens of the southern neighborhoods of Los Santos? Ms. Talley. I think that is a great question. And being somebody who was on a scene responding to a call and was caught in the middle of a gang shootout, I think that the most important part isn't focusing on the who, I think it's more focusing on the why. I think we would need to look at why these gangs are doing what they're doing in their neighborhoods and then redirecting our efforts into providing them other things to do that would lead them away from a life of crime. I think that trying to just completely focus on the individual instead of looking at the source of why they have this behavior and looking at why they need to do the things that they do would just be a waste of time and resources. So I think that really tackling the root of the problem would be looking at why they're doing what they're doing instead of who's doing what they're doing. That's all. All right. Uh, Ms. Gray? Yes, thank you. So I hate to beat a dead horse here, but really my whole focus is on community. Uh, community and in this regard, also training. So training for the SASP is one of my main focuses. I want to make sure that it is a transparent thing, that uh, the officers are being trained properly and extensively, as well as 
creating more sense of community down there with events or otherwise. Because if you all know each other, you're not going to shoot each other. That's typically how it goes. If you're in good standing with somebody, it's not like... <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I feel like a good standing with each other is the first thing to start with. That is all. Mr. Metro? So for this particular issue, the answer, there's, there's not an exact clear answer. What I would try to do is I would go down and speak with the community there. And then I would also speak with the police department. And from there, I would try to find some sort of correlation, find some sort of common ground. What problems are the people of the South side experiencing? And what sort of change do they want to see? And then I go to the police department and ask them, what are, the, what are the problems they're seeing and what are the change they want to see? And from there, we come to some sort of unanimous decision that benefits everybody. So I think that it is a conversation that needs to be had, and it is a conversation that I will have. But uh, it is one that will be civil, and I will figure out the problems on each side and attempt to solve it. Thank you. Mr. Merle? I would really agree with a lot of the uh, the sentiments which Trip expressed. You know, I feel like it's not so much about, you know, what's going on, it's the why. Uh, as a former first responder, you know, Sergeant San Andreas State Police Department, uh, I would really place a lot of faith in programs like the one being headed up by Miss Sanford right now, which uh, Shimon is participating in. Uh, I feel like if we give them more opportunity to step away from that kind of lifestyle, uh, it's just going to be a slow fight to combat it. Uh, it's not something which ends overnight, but with programs like that, it's something which we can achieve slowly. That is the end of my answer. All right, we're now going to go to the two minutes of question phase, starting with you, Ms. Talley. I would... Actually, no rebuttal. Ms. Gray? Yes, for Metro. How can it, how can you be so sure that going to both of them, you, they would you would be able to come to a unanimous decision and that everybody would actually follow it? Mr. Metro. Um, I'm not sure that we would come to a unanimous unanimous decision. That's why I said it's a conversation that needs to be had. I would speak with the people of these various locations. I would speak with the police department and attempt to come up with some sort of solution. If not, then other things would have to be explored. But it is a very complex answer that I don't think anyone really has um, um, the answer to. So, no, I'm not sure that there would be some sort of um, unanimous decision, but I would do my best to attempt to create one uh, that benefited everybody. Mr. Moreau? Uh, I have no rebuttal. Miss Gray covered it for me. All right, we're going to move on to the next question. All right. A high amount of arrest for violent crimes also involves arrest for unlawful possession of Class 2 and Class 3 firearms on individuals that should have no legal access to such weapons. What would be your approach on preventing felons from acquiring not only firearms in general, but also higher class weapons? We're going to start with you, Miss Gray. I'm going to be honest here. That's kind of a tough question because uh, that's nothing I've ever thought about. Um, that's something I would definitely have to work with, uh, with the police department as well as the rest of the government. Um, the only answer I could really give in this moment until I've learned more about it would just be working with the police department as well as uh, talking to the community and seeing what the issues are and why everyone results to violence in this nature. That is all. Mr. Metro? Uh, yes, I'm inclined to agree with uh, what uh, she just said. Um, Definitely trying to find the root of why uh, people are shooting other people. Um, 
through means of um, different psychiatric programs and various programs of that nature, because trying to pin down a black market uh, is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. So I think we need to address the behavior uh, first before we ever try to track down this black market that, I mean, is so vast. It could be anywhere. So I would say to focus on the behavior and from there try to uh, address that. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Merrill? So I actually have uh, two proposed solutions for this. Uh, the first already lies within SASP. Uh, they do have a criminal investigation division, which is you know set up to, to de-establish gun smuggling rings, like the ones which we are clearly facing by the amount of Class 2 and Class 3 weapons on the streets right now. Uh, I feel like the department just needs to pour, you know, some more faith into that division, maybe give them a few new heads and really just hit the ground running with tackling that specific issue. And by voicing it, I feel like uh, justifiably they can pay more attention to that. Uh, the second, which I would propose, is uh, something which I actually proposed a while ago uh, when I was in LSPD. At the time, I was only an officer, so obviously I did not carry much weight, but uh, which is why it didn't go through. Uh, I would really suggest uh, a gun buyback program. You know, it's another opportunity for felons to change back their lives. And it's, uh, you know, it's an opportunity for the police department to uh, use some of their excess funds and solve their uh, their biggest problem, you know, to put it blunt. Uh, I feel like if we really had more of that kind of a program in the city going, uh, we'd see a lot of people turn their lives around. That is the end of my answer. Ms. Teller. I would agree with uh, Tommy. I think that working with SASP and having more heads and more faces in CID would be a great help to combating the gun problem. However, at the end of the day, unfortunately, if people are inclined to get a gun, they'll find a route to get it. So I think that also working with the people and figuring out the why, why do they need a gun and working with them back to one of my previous sensors would help as well and obviously pushing more resources to CID and giving them more help with what they need to do to investigate where these guns are coming from and then we can pinpoint who is getting them and then work to resolve the why they need them nothing further all right, well, we're going to move to the question phase. If you had any questions about what the other candidates say and stuff, Miss Gray, we're starting with you. Yes, thank you. So as a strong supporter of uh, caring for your own safety, uh, I believe that it's a good thing for people to carry for their own safety. But at the same time, I would prefer that they do it legally and safely. So in this aspect, I wanted to ask Mr. Morello over there, would you be able to ensure that this buyback problem will grant them safety from being arrested for having such a weapon illegally? Or would you be charging them for having it? Mr. Metro? Morello. Um, that was a, a question for Mr. Morello. Yes. Or are, you, are we just going down the line? Just now? going down the line. I, I have no uh, no questions, no rebuttal. All right, Mr. Morell? Uh That's a great question. You know, ultimately, I feel, uh, you know, it hasn't been exactly defined the uh, the extent of the powers of this office, but uh, that's feel like more a question for the SASP. Obviously, programs like this in the past in other cities, you know, you're doing it to, to offer somebody forgiveness, right? If somebody is willing coming to you to turn over their firearms, then, you know, they obviously should not be charged because it's something that they are doing willingly, right? And I'm not suggesting that we give people $10,000 for a Beretta, right? It would be reduced rates for the pistol. So it would just be a little bit of compensation, a little bit of incentive to get down there, but not anything crazy like, oh, I'm going to go cash in half my armory for, uh, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. Nothing crazy like that. Uh, I would also really like to uh, stress on what she said uh, about uh, gun violence and protecting yourselves you know, it's something that I, this kind of controversial, but uh, I would encourage more felons to apply for taser licenses, right? Uh, something similar that we've seen in San Francisco, where they uh, had extreme gun violence. They encouraged uh, their uh, their residents to carry paintball guns 
instead of uh, instead of firearms, and it actually kind of worked out. You know, drive ball paintballings, it's still an issue, but it's much less of an issue uh, than drive by shootings, right? So we could do the similar thing here with tasers. That is the end of my rebuttal. Mr. Tyler. Nothing to add. All right, we're going to move along to the next question. Along with the previous mentioned increase of violence in most of the southern areas of Los Santos, there has been an increase in organized crime in general, and with it, an increase in repeat offenders for violent crimes. What changes would you make to both our justice system and correction systems to prevent this? We're going to start with you, Mr. Mitchell. Well, I can't so, uh, um, being a defense lawyer, I've come to find that the issue, in my opinion, lies in how we rehabilitate these individuals. Um, you know, certain charges like menace to society leaves the individual no choice but to go back to his life of crime. Um, it seems to be a system of constant punishment, and I don't think that that is constructive for uh, criminals. Um, if you continue to punish the criminal, they'll most likely continue to just be a criminal. So I think that we need to take things away like um, menace to society, which is one of the first things I would work on. I know it would be difficult, but I have plenty of... Uh, psychological studies uh, based on uh, being institutionalized and institutionalization uh, that would support my claims. Uh, but I think a lot of it has to do with uh, locking people away, uh, throwing throwing the key away and keeping them in there for many, many, many months. Um, I don't think that that's fair to these people. And I think that we can do a lot better um, to rehabilitate them and reassimilate them into the society to be constructive and helpful citizens of this community. And that is all. Thank you. Mr. Merle? Uh, I would agree with some of the sentiments uh, expressed by Mr. Metro. Uh, you know, we really have to start treating these people better if we want them to be better, right? Which is why I would encourage an increase in some of the more serious crimes, uh, you know, particularly battery of a public official, attempted murder, so on and so forth. But I would also very much so encourage a reduction in, uh, in penalty for some of these not so serious crimes. Uh, just to give an example, uh, this is also a very controversial thing, but I would suggest, and this is just an example, obviously, uh, I would suggest reducing possession of cocaine from a felony to a misdemeanor, right? Because at the end of the day, you know, cocaine is a very bad thing in our, in our communities, right? Drugs tear communities apart. But ultimately, does somebody with one gram of cocaine deserve to be labeled as a felon for the rest of their life? I think not. That is the end of my answer. Ms. Tyler? I would agree with some of what Mr. Morello was saying. I think that some sentences could be reduced, especially for first-time offenders. I mean, everybody makes a mistake once in their life, and I don't think that they should be punished for that. However, I don't think that uh, removing the menace to society charge, like Mr. Metro was saying, is really the right thing to do. I think that if he's going to go down a rehabilitation route, I think that would put more strain on San Andreas Fire and Rescue and the psychiatric team there. I think that a better plan for menaces to society wouldn't be to abolish it completely. I think that instead of reworking it into a multiplier for charges where once a certain threshold has been met for violent felonies, where any felonies after that would have the sentence multiplied by X amount, would hopefully sway people away from a life of crime and abolishing menace to society would, in my honest opinion, encourage more people to do crime because they would have nothing serious to fear for other than the charges in that moment. Whereas if they faced more jail time further down the road, if they continued a career of crime, that might sway them away from pursuing a career in crime. That's all. That's great. So in this case, I'd like to propose that we would focus more on criminal as well as civilian rehabilitation. A lot of the reasons that this stuff happens is because people don't have the help that they need. Um, I believe that doing this would allow everyone to be in a better space. Um, on top of that, I also would propose having a Sky Foundation fund to help those who 
are in need, and then especially new, new citizens to the city. Because overall, the main reason, in my opinion, that people do this is because they need the money. And if they can get the money faster and easier, they're going to do that. Especially if they don't have the patience to go out and, say, grind at a, at a job at one of the businesses that we have. So now it wouldn't be constantly giving out to those basically begging for money. It'd be for those who are actually in need of it, those who need re rehabilitation to become a citizen once more, um, just overall creating a better space for everyone to be in. That is all. All right. So the rebuttal phase, um, Mr. Metro. Now, what um, what Miss Taylor said is is absolutely true. In my um, in my defense of my client Ryan MacArthur, who had uh, two menace to society charges, um, I had explained to the court that he had he had served thousands of days. He had paid hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines. If not paid, he was in debt from these. And Miss Taylor got up on the stand to speak against my client. Uh, wanting basically further punishment for him. So, yes, what she's saying is coming absolutely from the heart because I've seen it in person. I've seen her try to cut down a man's future who served his time for the DOJ, who served all his sentences, who was in debt and down to his last wit's end. And she wanted to continue to punish this individual so you ask yourself, some of the people out there, if you get a menace to society charge and you have her as governor, what's going to happen? Is she going to show up and say you need more time? You need to be a second menace to society? So I've seen her try to end a man's life and career in the sense of no more future. And it is disgusting to me, to be honest. So uh, thank you. That is all. Mr. Murad? Uh, I had a, a rebuttal, but I'm going to go ahead and let Trip and uh, Metro duke it out over here. But I would also like to pay some attention to uh, Miss Gray's, uh, her idea of, you know, giving them programs to make money faster and easier. Uh, I would, with all of my heart, argue against that. As uh, like we said before, inflation in this economy has been a thing, a, a problem in the past and programs like that would only contribute to us heading towards another stock market crash. Uh, that is the end of my rebuttal. Ms. Tyler? Rumors are true. Yes, I did go up and speak against Ryan MacArthur at his expungement. However, I do recall myself saying that I don't, at this current moment in time, believe that he should have an expungement because he had shown no effort to rehabilitate himself as a citizen working with San Andreas Fire and Rescue. I know how many attempted murders he had on LEOs. And at that time, he showed absolutely no remorse for that. So I do believe that if Menace to Society was not a charge, that would have only encouraged him to commit more crime because he did not have that charge to face. If charges such as Menace to Society were to not exist, can you think of how many more people would be encouraged to commit a life of crime and not only attack LEOs, but then perhaps maybe also San Andreas Fire and Rescue caught in the crossfire? And these are people that help us every day. You know, they're a foundation of the society and... I hold no prejudice against any criminals, if that's another thing that he was trying to hint at. I deal with them in my day-to-day -day job right now as a doctor, and I understand that they're humans too. However, when they're making choices which not only can threaten my life, but of the lives of people that I work with every day and care for deeply, I, I do believe that they should have to face some time for that, yes. Nothing further. And Ms. Gray. In response, um, we've actually had a, a similar kind of program before. It was the fly-in fund. Uh, I believe it actually helped a lot of people stay within the city, which ultimately helped the city out. So I wanted to bring it back, but in my own way. I, I wholeheartedly disagree with what he says. I, I believe that people really do try to get money quick and fast and to help negate that I would like to assist them in their endeavors to help keep them fed, help keep them so they could even just get water, clothes on their back, a car to get to their job. That's the whole point of this fund. That's all. All right. All right. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next question. 
It is a known issue that there has been an increase in citizens not respecting laws involving vehicle offenses, causing an increased rate of accidents and destruction of both public and private property. How would you address this, Mr. Morado? Uh, traffic legislation is a difficult subject, right? Obviously. Um... You know, I feel like where we at right now, we have our charges and we have, you know, speeding tickets and everything else. But I, ultimately, I think that that issue boils down to a problem with guns, like we said before, right? With the amount of weapons on the street and the amount of reoccurring felonies we have. Because ultimately, when you clock somebody going, you know, as a former LEO, when you clock somebody going 100 miles an hour, right, in the city, that is unacceptable. I mean, that's super speedy, right? It's a felony. I think uh, I think you get 30 months for it and around a $3,000 fine, or maybe it's five now, but it's it's astronomical, right? That charge is there to combat that. But the issue is that we get so distracted by, you know, who's in the car. We get so distracted by what do they have on them. So it, it, to be honest, you know, as an LEO, and I know this is a sentiment that was shared with some other people, you don't really want to push that charge on them because you don't want somebody coming after you. Uh, at the end of the day, you want to maintain a healthy relationship with the community, and you're just not able to do that with where we are right now. That is the end of my answer. Ms. Tully? I would agree with uh, Morello. Um, I mean, I know that there's been situations where people escape from a scene and you catch them speeding 100, 120 plus through the city. And I would have if I was in that situation in the back of my mind, constantly going, well, if I pull them over and try and push a charge on them, what's going to happen to me? So I think that dealing with that in the moment might sometimes not be the best solution to that. I think something better would be adding speed cameras or something like that around the city that would catch these people. And that would also aid in slowing people down while not putting any uh, officers' lives in danger. Nothing further. On to you, Miss Gray. Well, it's not just about the officers, it's about everyone's safety, first and foremost. Um, I think a strong emphasis on making sure people know the dangers and how much responsibility it is to be within a vehicle. Um, I guess one thing you could say is just put an emphasis on the driving school. The driving school is very short and sweet. Um, send people back if they can't if they can't drive. Take away their license is stuff we do now. Uh, the speed cameras is a very good idea and I'd have to give credit that to that to her. Um, yeah, that's all. Mr. Metro? Um, so um, I don't have the expertise as Mr. Morello does. Um, so I, I'm not entirely sure how I would handle this. Um, I would most likely meet with law enforcement, meet with the experts and ask them how we could solve this problem because I really have no insight on, on this issue, uh, exactly. All right. Uh, question phase, uh, Mr. Rell. I have no rebuttal. Uh, Ms. Tella? I have no rebuttal. That's great. None for me. And Mr. Metro. So uh, one of the things that I do want to bring up is, um, you know, Mr. Morello uh, is, is saying that in, in a gist that you know, in some kind of way he wants to help with this um, speeding problem. This, um, excuse me, uh, this, this problem, but yet he wants to take away helmets for bike riders. So wouldn't that put a little more pressure on um, SAFR and the police department with the amount of head injuries they would see, the increase in uh, traumatic brain injuries that they would see? Because this is a specific thing that uh, Mr. Morello does want to get rid of. So it seems a little contradictory um, to what, he, what his sentiment was. Um, thank you. Definitely interesting. We are going to the last question of the night. Uh, this question 
It is a known issue that a bigger section of the unemployment rate is composite by newly arrived citizens. And a vast majority of these citizens also end up relying on minimum wage jobs. What would you do in order to solve these issues? Ms. Tell? I think that a big part of this is uh, that businesses may or may not be advertising that they're always hiring. Yes, a business might always be open, but the only advertisement I've seen recently, although I don't look at them that often, is for the lunchbox that's hiring. They just put out an advertisement today. So I think that if more businesses were not willing, but able to give new citizens to the city a chance to spread their wings, you know, give them the opportunity to get on their feet, show them that they have the skills and talents that the business may be looking for. There is plenty of people, I'm sure, in the city who have skills that would benefit businesses, whether it's event ideas, marketing, PR, new, just new eyes for businesses. And I think a lot of that would help the people working these minimum wage jobs at the airport or bug stars or group sex security, whatever it may be. I think that businesses should give people a chance to show themselves and show their talents. Nothing else to add. That's great. So one thing I would like to say is that uh, as a previous DOJ clerk, we had hiring events that we would host for all the businesses to come. And honestly, I think pushing for more of those via the DOJ would help a lot. But this also means that we would need the businesses to take initiative and also agree to participate in these. And we would need more of them. I'd say at least two to three per month in both during like the day and evening. I think that's something that could vastly help just get information out there let people new citizens know that there are places hiring and that it is worth their time to actually seek these out that's all mr metro so um these this the city sponsored events uh, that i would like to do every other weekend uh, with the businesses, of course, I uh, attending. One, I think that this would uh, address the problem heavily because Everybody knows uh, I, want, are I want the businesses to start getting um, more patrons. And with more patrons, you need more hands. You need more people to prepare food. Um, you need more people to work. And I think with that kind of demand, I think that that would probably most likely easily um, assault um, this issue head on. So um, that would be the main thing that I want to do uh, because I believe that the city events with the businesses uh, solves actually a lot of different various problems. Um, but that that's my take on it. Thank you. Mr. Monroe? Monroe? Uh, <laughs> I would um, I would definitely, you know, point out that there are certain businesses, sure, that are just not open to hiring new people just because they already have a reliable staff and they don't need more people, right? It would just be... Uh, too many hands on deck right but there are most definitely businesses which are consistently hiring you know i see a lot of ads from the bean my business personally i've been trying to find good help for quite some time right and uh unfortunately i've only been able to find three or four hands right um but i think a lot of it relies in paying more attention to encouraging people to establish more temporary businesses right uh, because at the end of the day, if there are more businesses for people to be hired by, then there are more jobs, right? Um, you know, I'd like to also address a, a problem, which is a problem now, definitely not as big of a problem as it was in the past, but a, a problem that shows its ugly head every now and then nonetheless. Um, there's kind of a, a, a polarization at times from, uh, you know, members in the city who have been around for a while and those uh, that are newer, right? I feel like it's something that our community needs to address. Uh, we have to be receptive to new people, right? You have to be able to understand uh, the position that people are coming from when they're flying in. And I feel like if we're able to communicate better with them, then we can really 
establish you know more of a connection and give them more jobs and make it so that way you know maybe nobody has to go work down at the airport for a while uh, that's the end of my uh, answer to that question all right we're back to the question phase uh miss teller no rebuttal miss gray no not at this time thank you mr metro uh nothing to say thank you mr Moreau. uh you know what no rebuttal all right, and that was the final question for us this evening. I want to thank every single one of the candidates for coming out. You guys gave wonderful answers and stuff. Thank you guys so much. I hope that the audience here was able to get the message that they wanted to receive for you guys. Maybe help with the votes. Uh, I'll give it now to the DOJ if they have anything else that they want. Mills. That's you. Mills. No, on, that's you. Throw us a curve. Mills. No, that's you. That's Mills. You. Mills. No, that's you. I don't have anything Mills. further. If you can just close it out. M oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. Hold on. Ah, yes. Okay. okay. Actually, yes. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending today. Um... You know, as I said in the beginning, um, you know, we have four... Oh, oh, God. Sorry, this place is moss-covered. The Chief Justice never pays for it to be cleaned. Um, I'm not talking about the algae. I'm talking about the ma Sergeant Major. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, we have four relatively decent, somewhat okay candidates that you should consider voting for. Uh, we'll announce the details on how to vote for them in the next couple of days here. Um, just keep an eye out in the in your emails and um, through your city announcements. And when the voting commences, we'll then announce the winner. Um, thank you for coming to the debates. And if you could just give each of the candidates a hand, cheer them on, and also cheer on for Joe Spears. Everyone. Yes, good. I have an unbiased take. <laughs> so good job, everyone. No specific candidate. <laughs> You're allowed to cheer for your specific candidate in the crowd, though. I can't. You can, yeah. you can, you can say something. You're allowed to say something. You don't just have to clap. Go, Justice! Yes. <laughs> this is your only time to cheer, everybody. Cheer! Woo! Oh. The enthusiasm is absolutely enthralling. So I'm like, yay! Yay! I'm politics and all of that. You, you love politics too. I love politics too. So all right, thank fun. you guys all for coming. Uh, please leave in an orderly manner.